Hello and welcome to the France 24 interview. Our guest today is Thomas Pesquet. He is certainly the most famous French astronaut. He has spent 196 days in space. Welcome uh, to our program, Thomas. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Pleasure. So you're here because you have decided to put this, this fame uh, to profit for an NGO called Aviation Sans Frontières in French, which means Air Aviation Without Borders. Uh, first, can I ask you what this NGO does? So what they're doing is really putting aviation um, to the service of humanitarian aid and relief all across the world, which means transporting all the cargo that you need, all the medical uh, logistics, and also ferrying people, carrying people back and forth, uh, bringing those children in need of an operation to you know the places when they can get it, and then bringing it back, uh, bringing them back to uh, where they belong. So it's really putting the aviation network um, at at a good use, and it's giving wings to humanitarian effort all across the world. Why did you choose specifically to work with them? Well, because so um, when I was on the, on the space station for um, for a long time, you look at the Earth and it looks so fragile and so tiny, um, and then and then you really get into that, that habit of thinking, what could I do? How can I make the world a better place, so to speak? Um, and then coming back uh, on Earth, you know, I was looking around and I decided finally to help them because I used to be a pilot before I became an astronaut. So it's really in my DNA. I, I understand how they work. Uh, I can relate to what they're doing. And maybe one day I have this dream that I could be on the field, you know, flying those small Cessnas uh, and going to places uh, in the middle of the unknown and, uh, and maybe getting some uh, adventure out of it. So that's why I decided today to uh, help them out uh, the best I can. Um you, you know, it's, it's, it's something rather unusual, I, I believe, for astronauts to, to put their name, uh, to, to sponsor NGOs, is it not? It is, it is quite uncommon. Not so much in Europe, though, but in the US, it's, it's actually forbidden by the rules of the ISS, the International Space Station Program, for legal reasons. If you help one NGO, then all the other ones can complain that, you know, you're giving them a favor. Um, so NASA doesn't want to open that box. So the rule, standard rule for my NASA American colleagues is they cannot do it whatsoever. They cannot endorse anything. Uh, we have an exception here uh, in Europe, and the European Space Agency allows us to to choose one and pick one charity each. So for other colleagues, uh, other Europeans from other nations, they they picked one in their respective countries, and uh, and today my choice is uh, Aviation Sans Frontières. So, Saying with this 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 fame of yours, indeed, you you put to good use with this NGO. But what is quite remarkable is this fame in itself, because there is a yearly uh, popularity contest here in France, which is uh, run by IFOP, which is one of the main polling structures here in France. And while you came out fifth this year, uh, behind Kylian Mbappé, the famous footballer, and in front of uh, Zinedine Zidane, which is quite remarkable and quite unusual for uh, an astronaut. Where, why do you think this has happened? Well, I think it's a combination of a, of a lot of factors. Uh, one of them being that, you know, back in the days, we've had, we've had flights before. I'm only the 10th Frenchman to fly into space, but uh, Frenchman and woman. Um, but um, now, nowadays, we have an internet connection on board the space station. We have social medias. We can take pictures. We have digital cameras, which we didn't used to have, didn't used to have 10 years ago. So I think that certainly played a role. Um, the, the, just the means of communications that, yeah, that were available the French public to me. actually followed your adventure in real time, in a sense. I mean, you were posting yeah. very, very often. You know, you you were on television here in France as well. Yeah, yeah. But I think I, I really tried to to share the adventure uh, genuinely. I was not trying to achieve anything. I don't have anything to sell today or to gain really with with that popularity. But but it was really a pleasure for me to share the adventure and then and then. To relate to the people, I was trying to explain really to tell them, look, this is what we're doing. It's not something very remote and something untouchable, you know, very far away, uh, far removed from your daily life. No, we're doing it for you. This is what we're doing. This is what the earth looks like. This is what your city looks like, by the way. You're on the picture. And, and, and for some reason, people could relate to it. And that's good because it shows that space and space exploration has the potential still today. Um, you know, to make people's dream. And you, you see it in Hollywood as well. Every other movie that comes out these days seems to be about space. Mm. And so some, I mean, 
some important newspapers, for example, Le Monde has uh, recently wrote an article saying that uh, there was a generation pesquet in engineer schools in France. I mean, how does all that feel? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a, well, first of all, it's, it's still, it's a lot of responsibility, right? You have, have to have to be careful now what I do when I cross the street because people are going to say, look, he's picking his nose or whatever. <laughs> but um, but no, I think it's great because because I really try, there's, there's some important topics that I keep talking about over and over again, um, education, because I think it's the key to almost any problem in the world. Uh, gender equity is also really hugely important for me, protecting the environment, and, and then also European cooperation is a big one, because I think now that people have a tendency to not really trust the future, be scared of the future, and then fall back, you know, and, and, and close themselves in instead of opening up. And I'm really trying to fight that trend as much as I can, um, and it's getting some traction and some echo, particularly with young people. So I think it's, it's great because it gives me confidence for the future. You are a tireless advocate of fighting climate change, aren't you? Yeah. Because you say from the ISS, you can actually see it. What's that mean? What do you actually see from the ISS? You so know? you can see, well, you don't see the climate changing in front of your eyes, but you see, you really see the adverse effects of climate change. You see river pollutions, uh, you see... Uh, you know, on the sea, in the sea as well, you see ice melting, not, not over the course of a six months mission, but you know, mission after mission, year after year. Um, and you see air pollution, some cities you can't even take a picture of because it's just covered in smog uh, the entire day and the entire night. Uh, so you see all this, you see deforestation in, uh, in South America. You can see it very clearly, almost with the naked eye, with just a small zoom on your, on your camera. So, um, so yeah, you can see it. And, and really what it is, it's, it's taking a step back and putting the earth at a scale that you can actually comprehend and encompass. And that makes it so much more real than when you're just sitting in a, in a room like we are today. And you know, it's very virtual, those, those scales are huge. You know, the human brain is not equipped for that. Um, so by taking a step back and, and, and changing the scale at which it all happens, then it makes it so much more real. And that's what I'm trying to, to explain really to people. Now, talking about space, I mean, uh, we're seeing a lot of things change these days. As you know, NASA has decided to send astronauts back to the moon mm -hmm. by 2024. Now, first question, do you think that's possible? <laughs> you know, everything is possible in space, but, but you, need, you need the effort, um, which is the engineering, uh, the technology, and it, it's also the budget. Obviously, nothing is, comes for free. Um, so I think if you put your, your mind into it, you, you could do it. Uh, but now there's also the question of, are we willing to accept as much risk as we did in the 60s and 70s? Because we've become, when I'm saying we, our societies, that we've become very adverse to risk, risk adverse. Um, they took huge, enormous risks back in the day. So everything worked out, uh, but today would be completely unacceptable to lose you know, an astronaut or on a mission. So we're, we have so much safety built into our systems, then, then it's, it's, you know, it's, it's ironic, but it's even more complicated to go mm. to the moon today than it used to be. Uh, this being said- just, we've, we've seen that. I mean, it's very yeah. difficult. The Russian, the, the, sorry, the Indians have just failed. Yeah. Uh, the Israelis failed. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese actually succeeded. It's that tough. It is that tough. And actually, by, by working on it, because we're working on it with the European Space Agency in partnership with NASA, and I'm working on it when, when I'm not training, I only now realize how hard it was um, and everything that went into the success that they've had in the 60s. That, that, it was really that hard. Um, so it's good. It's good that there's a lot of enthusiasm, um, but I also want to tell people, look, it's, we're, we're not going to live on Mars in five years. It's just not going to happen. That's not what we're saying. If somebody's saying this, um, either they don't know or they have something to gain out of it. But we're enthusiastic. We want to go there, but we know it's going to be difficult and we know it's going to take time. So bear with us. We'll, we'll get you there, but it's going, to take, it's going to take some time. I guess the moon is probably a dream, is it? Or would you love it? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, the, the moon. so being being on the ISS was absolutely unbelievable. You float all the time, and that's also it's as far as as you can get as a human being. Uh, but the day there's a destination that's further away, and obviously all the astronauts are going to volunteer because you know that's the state of mind you have to be in. But but you have to imagine walking on a on a uh, not on a planet but on a satellite of a planet. It, the, the sheer desolation and the beauty of it, and the fact that you're the only one you know there at the time. And it's so dangerous, so risky, and so hugely important. That, that's such an adventure. I mean, it, it makes, my, it makes my, my heart beat rise just talking about it. 
What's the next mission for you? So for me, um, we have regular missions to the ISS because it's a laboratory and there's a lot of science and science experiments to be done. And it's going to be around for at least 10 more years until we've, we've reached not even the, the end of our, of our ideas in terms of science, but until we've done enough so that we can consider it uh, successful. So um, we'll go back. I, I might go back again, a uh, long-term mission. And, uh, and then after that, well, who knows, I, I could... I could dream of setting the foot on the moon one day and down the line, but that's in 20, 25 years. Maybe I'm too old already, but we'll see a big international human mission to Mars. And that's going to be the, the adventure of, uh, of the century. The adventure of the century, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we were lucky enough uh, recently. I mean, I, this question has been asked to you a thousand times, but I, I spoke to another astronaut called Jack Luzma recently, and uh -huh. he told me that he couldn't get enough of being up there. I mean, he was an astronaut back in the 70s, and he said, we were trying to stay when, when we were up there, we were trying to stay longer, trying to convince that we had to make this mission longer. Is that something you feel as well? There is this, you, you want to be up there? Or? Well, you do want to be up there, and that, but I think there's a, there's a change nowadays. The missions are long duration missions, six months on the ISS. Back in the days, it used to be 10, 15 days on the shuttle, uh, and you're so busy that by the time you come back to the ground, you, you barely have any memories of your stay on orbit. Um, nowadays, we can, we can take some more time on Sundays in the evening, take some more pictures. I try to take a lot of pictures. So, um, so by, the, by the time you're supposed to come back home, you're also happy to see your family and your friends that you haven't seen for six months. But it also feels like you're losing something. It feels like you're losing your superpowers because you're not able to float and fly anymore. You're not able to carry those you know, expensive lows with only two fingers. So really, you were a superhero. Uh, seeing her from above, and now you're back to normal. So you want to regain your superpowers at some point down the line, and that's why we all dream to come back. Regaining your superpowers. Well, thank you very much and for speaking to, my, to us. Thank you very much for watching, and obviously you can watch this interview again, if you wish so, on France24.com.